An Ode to a Imagine Fall in the Fall Village, Chapter 1, First Part. There were villages that shone in one season beyond all others, and in the case of Shirley's door it was the fall. The community of less than 2,000 was situated roughly in the center of the Landau Plain, and when its deep green world began to take on the colors of the sunset, the strangest activity took place. The normally taciturn villagers would host travelers who were merely passing through in their very own homes, and many children who were normally cooped up in their houses would race around town while unique serenity hung in the air. It was as if the fall had granted them special permission, and the people set benches out in front of their gates, listening to the crunch of fallen leaves underfoot on the red brick roads while they shared cheap wine and long conversations all day on holidays, and from dusk until late at night on the days that they worked. Well, they sure do like the fall there. Their nearest neighbors in the village six miles away would say. While their own fall was quite beautiful in its own right, those villagers knew that it lacked something. The fall people the Fall Village, an anonymous poet who stayed in Shirley's door once wrote. And surely there must be a Fall Traveler as well. However, that is not my lot. It should be noted that the poet's ode was never completed. The people in Village of the Fall could never surmise from the verse why the Fall Traveler was necessary. But as it happened, the anonymous poet might have done better as a prophet because a few years after his uneventful departure from the village, the local inhabitants were to learn why it was they had need of a traveler. This fall, to be exact. Patrick. Driving along a lone road that ran through a forest where only traces of green that remained, Lyle slammed on the brake sending up a sort of malodorous cloud that was a skirt and all around him. His sulfur-powered car halted. After exchanging looks with Cecile, who sat in the seat behind him, he then stared at the rider about to pass him on the right. The road forked about half a mile back on the way the two of them had come, but apparently some prankster had seen fit to remove the sign that pointed to down. The early autumn field still brimmed with afternoon light. Even if the rider chose the wrong road, he'd probably have time enough to backtrack and reach the village before evening. But this kind-hearted pair still thought it would be an unfortunate occurrence. When the four limbs of the white cyborg horse lined up with the front end of Lyle's car, he called it, Hey! Then fell silent. His reaction was prompted by the realization that next to him, Cecile was melting into a senseless mass. She was enraptured, to put it plainly. Yet the horse rode right by the side of the car without the rider saying a word. Hey, you, wait a second. Lyle called out to him only after the rider was a good thirty feet away. Despite the cold reception, he hadn't lost any of his kind-heartedness. The horse halted. The rather dusty coat of the white mount spoke volumes about the distance that he'd come. Thinking better of raising his voice, Lyle muttered, Here goes nothing. As he backed his car over to where the horse and rider waited. Between the wide-brimmed traveler's hat and long coat was an almost translucent fist that peered down at the boy and girl. Cecile began to melt again. The boy knew he had to make this quick. You know, there's a split in the road up ahead that's not marked. Go left and you'll hit Shirley's door. Right and you're into the swamp. Get lost out there and it could be a problem. They say the nobility had a mansion out in the swamp, and it's pretty murky territory even by day. 
and once he'd spoken Lara began blinking his eyes. If he didn't, he thought he'd lose his mind, too. Looking at a face that beautiful would draw the wrath of heaven. You have my thanks, the rider in black said, raising his left hand casually. His voice had a pattern to it that was painfully masculine. The disparity between the face and the voice sent a chill down Lyle's spine. It almost felt like a sensual shudder. I'd like to ask you something else as well, said the rider. Sure, please, ask away. Do you know where Helga of the Red Basket lives? Lyle looked at Cecile. The eighteen-year-old girl was still in a daze, so the boy elbowed her to return to her senses. I know, she said. So you're some acquaintance of old Helga, are you? Don't tell me you're the ghost of her husband. Although the boy thought it was a rather witty remark, he got no reply. Take the road to the right that he just mentioned and follow it into the forest. Cecile continued. Please be sure to keep your eyes open on the right. And the first house you'll see on that side is hers. If you're not careful, it's pretty easy to miss it. And the rider touched his right hand to the brim of his hat. Cecile understood that this was the greatest sign of gratitude this traveler could show. Okay. Watch yourself then, Lyle said. With her trademark red picnic basket stuffed full of plums, old Helga returned home. The scarlet-stained western sky was nicked by the silhouettes of trees. Even after noticing the white horse tied to the hitching post by her front door, the old woman wasn't the least bit surprised. In almost a century of living, there'd been over a hundred things more amazing than a sudden caller. And this particular guest certainly wasn't unexpected. Putting her hand on top of the horse's neck, she enjoyed the feel of its artificial hide as she said to it, Where's your master at? A sharp crack came from her back. Out of the woodshed, is he? Setting her basket down on the front stoop, she had just finished turning the corner when she encountered a figure in black. Seeing the great bundles of kindling he had under other arms, she remarked, It's not every day that you see a hunter chopping wood while his employer's out. You're Mr. D, I take it. The young man nodded. The air stirred. Even it felt his beauty. As if it were a sight too terrible to behold, and the old woman averted her gaze and stared at the wretched little hut at her back. Looks like there's enough kindling to last a hundred years back there. How long you been splitting it, anyway? I got here three hours ago, said Dee. And in all that time you didn't bother to go inside, but chopped wood instead. Some of them upstairs hunters would have gone on their way or forced their way into the house. You've had a damn good upbringing, haven't you? Why, I can tell that just by looking at your face. At any rate, welcome. Page break. Old Helga's request was a little out of the norm. Soon we'll be full on into fall. And when that happens, the nobility are going to play hell with the village. Her request was that Dee take care of them. Ordinarily, someone who'd suffered an attack would hire him personally. Or in cases where a whole community was plagued by the nobility, a representative would handle his employ. It was unheard of for an old woman who wasn't a victim of the nobility and seemed to have almost no chance of becoming one to hire an expensive vampire hunter for the sake of the entire village. Especially when she said the nobility wouldn't appear until fall. Do you have any proof? asked he. Not really, but if you want to get technical, there's always this. 
the crone put the contents of her basket on the wooden table. Several pieces of the black and rotten fruit rolled by Dee's hands. It really became noticeable how bad they were getting about a week ago. The same day I contacted you. Now they're all rotten. I've lived a hundred years, and I don't think this is any accident of nature. I'd given some thought about holding off until I was completely sure, but that would have went waiting until victims started cropping up. And what have you called me here for? I'm getting on in years, and don't have much time left. And I want to do some good while I'm still here. If you can, I'd like you to keep my name out of this while you go about your business. And there probably won't be any problems, you know. If that were the case, you wouldn't be sitting here now. But rest assured, I'll pay you as agreed regardless. Besides, just getting to sit here staring at your face like this, I get the feeling it'd be worth it just to meet you. You want to know why? The old woman asked as the silent embodiment of beauty flickered in her failing vision. After raising a steaming cup to her lips and taking a sip, she continued. Actually, you're a lot like my husband. Not your face, of course, but your general mood. According to what the old woman told him, her husband had joined a group trying to track down a noble in a neighboring village about eighty years ago, and had never returned. No body was ever found, but you never heard from him again, nor did the slightest rumor ever reach her ears. It had been summer when he'd set off, so she'd believed he'd be back in the fall. And even now, the old woman continued to wait. Fortunately, even eighty years later, she still experienced the season known as fall. The fall. Yes, the fall. In our village, everything starts in fall. That's when we gather our food for the winter, and when we collect the seed to we'll sow in spring. It's even when we store the water we'll need in summer. Fall is when people pass away, and when others are born, and it's when handsome travelers come along, too. I heard the nobility had a mansion here, said the hunter. Yes, for about the last five hundred years. They say they just abandoned everything and disappeared a hundred years ago. But at any rate, there was no one out there by the time I was born. Why did they disappear? I wouldn't know. They were real cruel nobles. And not an awful lot of robotic servants. Apparently they were researching something. There's no sign of it out there. I wonder if I should have drained the swamp. You mean to tell me you've already gone out and had a look? The crone said, her eyes going wide. In the span of three hours, you went into the swamp and split a whole shed full of wood to boot. You really aren't a blessed thing like the others, I guess. Is it far to the village? About thirty minutes if you gallop all the way. I suppose you could call this the outskirts. Helga asked him to hurry and at least check out the ponds if he could. I don't suppose anything could have possibly been slumbering there for the past century. But just to be safe. And they've got a custom here in the village that has me worried. The old woman confided. And that is? They offer a sacrifice. A real fine looking girl. And that's how they get them to leave everyone else alone. First part, end. Second part. The night air was comfortable. The girl had gone out to pick apples. On the east edge of town, in a spot known only to her, was a tree that spread its branches like a folding fan. 
Since before its fruit was fully ripe, the tree's bounty had been filling her mouth with its refreshing sweetness whenever she sank her teeth into it. By the girl's side was a young man. Ever since finishing secondary school, the two of them had been inseparable, and the villagers figured in a few years the couple would throw a modest banquet and be together for all time. Under the tree in question, the pair of bodies intertwined. But before the boy's arms could draw the full strength of his passion, the girl pulled back, and just the sort of mischievous teasing unique to their age, she circled around behind the tree trunk. The scent of the fruit in the night air, the scent of fall, lifted the girl's spirits. Tonight would no doubt be a special night. The girl grabbed one of the apples that swayed above her head and plucked it from the tree. Her lips were quite red despite their lack of lipstick, and as they closed around the fruit, her white teeth bit into it with a crisp snap. Mere seconds later, the girl spat out what she'd taken in her mouth. The bit that scattered at her feet and the fruit in her hand were rotten and black on the inside. Grabbing another one, the girl squeezed it between her fingers. The fruit cracked open and black juice dripped from it. Driven by fear, the girl called out the young man's name, but no matter how many times she shouted it, he didn't come. Terror tightened its corset around her. The girl circled around the tree trunk. The young man stood exactly where she'd left him, and although it looked like he hadn't moved an inch, there was something different about his pose. Both his arms were out in front of him, forming a rough semicircle. If the girl would have slipped between his arms and his body, it would have made for a fiery embrace. However, that embrace was not for her. Still calling his name, the girl touched the boy, at which point the seemingly faithless lover who had forgotten all about her toppled over without a sound. Why was it that her eyes were immediately drawn to his neck? Wrapped in a swell of powerful muscle, his throat had been split open like a pomegranate. It was easy enough for the girl to surmise that this was a fatal wound. Without even trying to get him back up, the girl spun around and was embraced. Even before she felt the terrific force of the arms that wrapped around her waist, the nape of her neck was ripped open. As her hand clawed out in agony, it caught hold of an apple on one of the larger bows, and when the fruit shattered in her wildly clutching fingers, sure enough, it was black to the core. Beige break. It started. That's what old Helga went into the barn to tell Dee around noon the next day, when she came back from town. Gal the carpenter's daughter and the Sarais's only son had been killed. They were found lying in an apple orchard in the eastern part of town this morning by the orchard owner. From what Doc Harmon says, it seems it happened sometime between two and five last night. Didn't their families go to look for them? Well, no, one noticed that they'd slipped out of their bedrooms. Anyway, it's perfectly natural to go somewhere and chat with someone on a fall night. Fall. The season when quiet loves were spoken. Did you take an impression of the throat wounds? I sure did. Picking up the piece of fast setting clay the old woman produced from her basket. Dee stared at it intently. A 
If their blood hadn't been sucked, you'd never know from this that it was the work of a noble, would you? Must be one hell of a crude noble, though. You reckon it was a servant of the nobility or something? It was a noble. D asserted softly. However, there's something odd about this. How's that? This wound is rather strange. I get no sense of the life force of the one who bit them from it. Huh. The crone said, her eyes bulging in their sockets. You mean to tell me there's life in the nobility? Perhaps unlife is the word for it. Dee replied, his fingers playing across the surface of the clay, like a physician searching for an injury. In that case, could it be a robot or something that bit them? No, that's not it either. I've never felt a presence like this before. Damn, said Helga. And here I was thinking it was going to be the nobility. Now don't you think for a single minute about letting this thing get away? I only do what I'm paid for. The crone struggled for words, finally saying, I was positive it'd be the nobility. But now we've got one hell of a surprise on our hands, don't we? Mm, where are the corpses? At this point, they'd be in storage. But in another hour, they'll be off to the crematorium. By sundown, they'd be ashes. And when she'd finished speaking, the crone backed away as if she'd received a terrible fright. Dee had just stood up. All that kindling, you didn't chop that for me, did you? The old woman said as she pointed to the pile. Look how neat it split. Fact is, you sliced it, didn't you? Practicing for a fight with the nobility. The wind that blew in through the doorway made the hunter's long hair dance like shadows. The old woman realized she'd been mistaken. She thought things had started with the discovery of the first two victims, but that wasn't the case. Now that this gorgeous youth was ready to make a stand, everything would begin. Nobility versus humanity. This was a matter of life and death, the likes of which could be seen nowhere but in the schematics of battle. D got off his horse in front of the morgue. In general, that would be adjacent to the sheriff's office or the hospital. In the case of Shirley's door, it was the former. The sheriff happened to be in his office at that time, and at first he responded in a guarded manner. But on hearing Dee's name, his demeanor quickly became warmer. So you're Dee, are you? Never thought I'd meet the real deal. To be honest, we're in a bona fide bind. We'll go on and look all you want. Of course there are already a couple of folks in there ahead of you. They just got here, but they'll be going soon. Leaving the sheriff's office, Dee slipped into the doors to the stone building that housed the morgue. An old man who seemed to be a deputy took one look at his face and bugged his eyes. On opening the steel door at the end of the hall, he was greeted by a desolate space. Three of the walls had windows to let in the light, but aside from that, there was nothing in the room save the wooden tables directly ahead of him that held the corpses. Before those tables, a pair of faces turned in Dee's direction. How are you? Lyle said with a touch of nostalgia, while Cecile promptly felt a flush of crimson rise in her cheeks. Fancy meeting you here. I didn't think you were any ordinary customer, but uh, you're not a vampire hunter by any chance, are you? Call me D. For an instant, Lyle's mind went blank, but he quickly reeled back with surprise. By the time he'd returned to his original position, his eyes were glazed with adoration. Mm. 
And Dr. Sosios up, uh, he said to her, Hey, you hear that? He said he's dead. We've got the frontier's greatest vampire hunter right here. Now he'll be safe as money in the bank. Sosios gazed clean into him all the while. D went over to the corpses, their rubber bags had been unzipped to the waist. Bloodless, the young man and woman's bodies looked like puppets. Rigor mortis had already begun to set in. Even the suture that ran in a straight line lent them an air of the surreal. As D touched his fingers to the horrid wounds of the dead, the living couple watched him. When D quickly stepped away from them again, the boy asked him what he was doing, but received no reply. The figure in black heading straight for the steel door as if he'd forgotten all about the other pair. Hold up a second. A flustered Lyle called her to him. Would you just let me talk to you for a second? I'm sure it must be fate that's brought us together like this. We need your help. I'm begging you. Cecile added, her head bowed. Dee stopped and turned to the pair. I've heard that in this village. They'll put her to sacrifice if this is the work of the nobility. Are you it? As the hunter asked that of the girl beside him, Lyle's eyes went wide. How on earth did you know that? He asked. A minute ago you told her she'd be safe as money in the bank. I suppose I did at that. So long as we've got you here, this can all be settled with this Cecile having to be sacrificed. The bastards here in the village are a bunch of weasels. Every time there's trouble, they leave it to one girl to bail them out, and then decide to keep quiet about it later. <laughs> like they know for sure that's going to make the nobility behave themselves and move on to another area. When we selected, asked E. Not long ago. Maybe an hour back. The mayor and all the other influential members of the community had come to her house and given her the news, the boy said. This very evening, Cecile would be left out in the place where the nobility had the greatest chance of appearing, and she'd have to spend the whole night there. Would that be the swamp? Sure enough, Lyle replied. And I'm going to keep her company. You mean this sacrifice isn't sent out there all alone? The village's second mayor was a good enough person. He allowed the girls to have a single escort. And Cecile is an orphan, you see. She's got no one to look out for her but me. The young man actually looked rather proud as Dee quietly gazed at him. We don't know for sure whether or not the nobility were actually responsible for this, said the hunter. You mean there's a chance they weren't? The boy and girl looked at each other. I've heard that there are demonic creatures in the lands of the West that rip open curbs and drink the blood. Why don't you try telling that to the mayor? It's no use. He and all the rest of us pigs are already dead. Sure, this is the work of the nobility. They won't listen to anything else anyone has to say. Why don't the two of you leave the village altogether? The pair exchanged looks of astonishment. They'd never even considered it an option. There was such solidarity in communities out in this cruel environment, no one could even think of leaving. The hue of hope tinged their faces, but it rapidly faded again. That won't work. I can't, Cecile said as she stared at Dee. Though there was sadness in her eyes, they lacked the kind of baseness that would have clung to him for succor. Her limited stores of self-restraint were doing a remarkable job of keeping her fear at bay.
My adopted mother and father still have to live here. If I were to run off instead of playing my part, the wrath of the whole village would come down on the two of them. In short, the one responsible has to either be caught or killed. Lyle said, slapping his hands together. Come on, we're begging you. Help us out here. We don't have a lot of money, but we'll do what we can to repay you. I already have another employer, Dee said, turning toward the steel door. As the lovers watched, the door shut again. As the lovers watched, the door shut again. But at that very moment, the two of them could have sworn they heard a hoarse voice around Dee's hips say, Well, you sure ain't the most accommodating guy in the world. Fade break. At the fork in the road, Dee bore left. His destination was the former site of the nobility's mansion, the present swamp. The reason he'd gone to the morgue was so that he might examine the wounds left by the nobility in person, but his fingertips had found nothing but failure. The bizarre information related by the clay cast was an accurate representation of the real thing. That being the case, there was nothing left to do but wait for his foe to appear. Regardless of his situation, he'd be able to make the first move so long as there was still daylight. And so the white horse and its inky black rider followed the road down a hill to reach a gloomy region, shrouded in a drifting miasma. Covering roughly six square miles, the swamp was dotted with nearly twenty bodies of water of various sizes. Despite the local climate, bacteria in the water kept it from ever dipping below 70 degrees. And the toxin-laden murk not only killed any animal that approached, but also gave rise to freaks immune to its poison. Aside from those villagers who collected such monstrous beasts for a living, no one ever ventured there, even by daylight. Leaving the path he'd visited the previous day, Dee dismounted by the shore of a small pond near the center of the swamp. Between the various bodies of the water, there were narrow roads and iron bridges that appeared to be from ancient times, but many of them had taken on a weird coloration or were hidden by thickets of trees. On the left-hand side, Dee sensed an intense presence, a darkness that he alone would have felt. Damn it all, cursed a voice he'd heard before. It's that guy. Looks like he followed you. You intend to just abandon him. Not replying to the horse voice, Dee went back to his steed and brought it to a gallop. After racing along for five minutes, he could see Lyle struggling by the water's edge. Spray was flying everywhere. The bluish-black hue of the water was no doubt due to the algae in it. Lyle's opponent was a creature that resembled an octopus. Nearly a dozen sucker-covered tentacles were wrapped around the boy's limbs, and the creature was trying to pull him into the depths. Lyle was armed with a steel harpoon. Though he attempted to stab at the creature's bulbous head, the blindingly quick movements of its tentacles always interfered, and the boy had all he could do to just keep the weapon from being taken from him. As Dee halted his horse, Lyle turned and looked at him. Even locked in this deadly struggle, he had apparently had enough presence of mind to notice the sound of the approaching hooves. Stay back, he shouted. I don't want this freshwater octopus getting anyone else on top of me. Just stay back and watch. And this guy's a real scrapper, said a voice that sounded thoroughly impressed as it came from the vicinity of Dee's left hand. 
D went down to the water's edge. I told you to stay back. You're at a distinctive disadvantage, D noted in an unreflected tone. Not a chance. I'm just about to declare victory. As his leg kicked into the air with a watery spray, and there was a tentacle coiled around him. Toward the bottom of the head, a pair of unblinking eyes glared at its prey. Damn it. Don't even think of helping me, the boy told the hunter. If you drown, you'll leave it. If you drown, you'll leave the seal all alone. Help me. Dee didn't go into the water, but there was a flash from his right hand. A tentacle was severed. The same tentacle that was wrapped around the harpoon. The head of the octopus quivered. Its high-pitched squeals became a clear cry of pain when the steel harpoon landed right between its eyes. Pulling his weapon from the octopus's head while the creature's spasms continued and it sank into the pond, Lyle fell back into the water for some time and simply tried to catch his breath. But the one who'd been about to die in the depths soon wanted to get back on dry land. Apparently his heart was also made of steel. When he glanced up quickly, Dee was just getting back on his horse. Wait. Wait just a second there. Hey. You tried to tell me you didn't come out here to help us. Not answering the boy, Dee gave a kick to his mount's flanks. At the same time, his left hand went into action. To the ordinary eye, it would have looked like a pair of arrows had suddenly materialized in his fist. But Dee had easily plucked these missiles, flying with enough force to penetrate stone right out of the air with his bare hand. That's what I came here to tell you. The folks from town were following you. Dee was already facing in their direction. On the opposite side of the lake, about a dozen riders had formed ranks on the high ground at the top of the good-sized hill. The bowmen at either end of the group had their second shots knocked. Don't move. The next time we won't miss. The giant in the middle bellowed. Based on the armor chest plate and the gauntlets he wore, he must have fancied himself the toughest character in the village. His confidence was made manifest by the rapid-fire crossbows that hung from either hip. That's the leader of the local guards, Bazar is his name. He used to be a drifter and a mercenary, and he knows his stuff. He's a lot better with a bow than what you just saw now, Lyle said in a wary voice. The rest of the group, with the exception of the elderly man to Bazaar's left, must have been members of the town guard. Once they saw that D wasn't moving, the group raced down with a thunder of hoofbeats surrounding the rider in black in under a minute. How did you know I was here? D asked, not sounding the least bit tense. Well, I heard about you from the sheriff. First, we went up to the Helga's place. She's been going on for some time now about how the nobility were coming. And after we knocked her around a little bit, she fessed up to being your employer. As for why we came out here, well, call it a hunch. We patched up the old woman just fine, rest assured. The older man said as if interceding, I'm Murtoch, the mayor. I'd like to thank you for saving my boy. He might not be much. But he's my only son, and I love him. For what that's worth, Lyle said, shrugging his shoulders in the water. Well, I have nothing to do with these clowns. I swear it. You've got to believe me. You've always been such a bumbler. I told you the next time you crossed me, I'd disown you, growled the mayor. I haven't had anything to do with you ever since Mom died. Why don't you just act your age, kid? And Basra told him. The remark seethed with malice, and Lyle spat at him in reply. 
Old Alga has given her agreement. You ought to leave the village immediately, the mayor told Dee. She hasn't said anything to me. At Dee's reply, tension scorched in the air. Don't try to bluff us, Hunter, Bowser said as he rose in the saddle. I've heard all about your skill, but no one's ever half as great as they're made out to be. It's ten against one, and you don't have your sword out. And even if you drew it, we'd be too far away for you to reach. It seemed the leader was at least smart enough to recognize the difference between bows and swords. Surveying the ten bows now turned on D, the mayor said, We decide how things go in our village, and we don't need any help from outsiders. Putting his hand in his coat pocket, the mayor pulled out a little bag and threw it down at Dee's feet. There's twice what Helga was going to pay you in there. Take it and be on your way. Gee, I really wouldn't do that, Lyle said in a frightened tone. You're dealing with vampire hunter D here. Before the boy had finished speaking, cries rang to the heavens. Two men, one positioned in front of D, the other behind him, had toppled backward holding their shoulders. The steel arrows stuck in each of them were the very same missiles they'd fired at D a short time earlier. And the instant that chilling realization dawned on Lyle, a white beam blazed across his retinas. A flash of light that danced across impossible distances. Bows and steely arrows flew into pieces, and that was only the start. The neatly severed fingers of the man who'd held them flew through the air as well. Huh. The mayor exclaimed, as he stared down dumbfounded at the blade leveled at his nose. Chapter 1, End Out in the Night Chapter 2, First Part Why the hell don't you do something, Gazara? Though his voice was hoarse, the mayor actually didn't completely comprehend the current state of affairs. His mind couldn't conceive of anything except the sword tip that had appeared before him in a split second. He didn't have the faintest inkling why the members of the town guard, targeting D, hadn't shot him with their bows yet. Bazaar didn't move. He thought he'd reply, but his voice wouldn't come out. A warm fluid was spilling in vast quantities from a cut that went halfway through his neck. Without time to raise the rapid-fire crossbows from either hip, or rather, before he could even think of doing such a thing, his subordinates had had bows and fingers carved from their hands, and his own throat had been slashed open. But more than that, more than anything, he was stopped by the unearthly aura of a gush from the handsome young man before him. He finally understood that this opponent was from an entirely different world. What do you intend to do with me? asked the mayor. Never meddle in these affairs again, the hunter told him. Oh, whose affair is this? The tip of the sword brushed against the base of his nose, and no sooner had it done so than the end of his somewhat hooked beak was sliced off neatly. With a scream, the mayor reeled backward. Falling back against the ground head first, right on top of the same bag of gold he'd thrown down. I see. I'll never do it again. The mayor frantically brought his hand up to his nose, where fresh blood quickly seeped out between his fingers. Ignoring the howling men on horseback, Dee turned and headed back the way he'd come. It was strange how not a single one of the mounts whinnied as he left. More than malice, more than anything, it was fear that colored the eyes of the mayor and Bowser as they watched the hunter go. Like I tried to tell you, he's Vampire Hunter D. Lyle said to them somewhat snidely, Bait break.
Once the mayor's group retreated in their sorry state, Lyle got on his horse and galloped off the same way Dee had gone. His soft fur car had been left back in the village. However, the only reason he'd been able to follow the mayor and the others out to the old woman's house, then beat them to the swamp using a route known only to himself, was because of all the long days he'd been driving through the area in his vehicle. At the edge of a small pond he found D. The hunter was bent over, picking the broad leaves of a plant that grew in profusion near the shore. But what would he do with them? In no time D went down to the water with a number of them under one arm, and threw one out onto the surface, and then he took a steady step onto it. The leaf was a foot in diameter. Though it might have been capable of supporting a small animal, there was no way it could ever support the weight of a human being. And yet the leaf didn't sink at all, but merely trembled a bit. One after another, D drew the leaves out in front of him and moved across the path and the water's surface, like a weightless illusion. The tenth leaf brought him to the center of the pond. Peering down at the surface by his feet for a few seconds, the figure then sent up a spray and left a set of ripples as he dove into the water. Racing down from the path to the pond, Lyle began to count the seconds instinctively. Ten seconds. Twenty. Although there was no evidence that the nobility had once had a mansion in this area, in his boyfriend, in his boyhood, Lyle had repeatedly heard the elders relate fantastic stories about seeing the dark sorcerers who slumbered in the middle of the swamp and gather en masse on a misty night. When the water suddenly cleared and allowed them to glimpse the palatial mansion in its depths, could it be that was what Dee had seen? Two minutes. Three. Five. Despair tinged Lyle's heart. He knew that Dee was a damp here. Those descending from noble blood lost half their strength in running water. If D were to be attacked by the freshwater octopus, his brethren in force. One of the leaves plopped out of sight. Beginning with the ones closest to the shore, they were sinking. Nine minutes. The last leaf vanished. Ten minutes. A black figure bobbed to the surface. Before the boy could even confirm that it was D. The hunter began doing the best stroke back toward shore. The hundred feet took him less than five seconds. On seeing Lyle, he remained expressionless and wiped his face. Was there anything in the water? The mayor's discerned son asked. The sun will be down soon, Dee replied. Though it didn't address his question in the least, his reply was good enough for Lyle. After all, the girl was going to be locked in in the sacrificial hut on the village outskirts all alone tonight. What are you going to do? Lyle S.D. as the latter walked off toward his white horse. If you keep an eye on Cecile, the noble will probably show up. Kill it and your work will be done, right? Come on, go out there with me. D galloped off without a word. As the gloomy figure rode away without a backward glance, the boy shouted at his back, You're cold-blooded, and an ingrate. I came out the way out here just to warn you that you were in danger. His vain howls of rage echoed for quite some time. Bit right. Although he had a very intention of waiting until Lyle got there, it looked like he wouldn't make it in time. When the group from the town guard came to her house to escort her, she thought she was ready. But her legs still trembled terribly. Her adopted father said nothing, while her adopted mother alone stepped outside 
and bid her farewell as the tears welled in her eyes. The only thing that kept Cecile going as she was loaded into the carriage and driven out to the hut on the outskirts of the village was the knowledge that in return for her sacrifice, the village would give her parents enough to live on for the next ten years. The hut was furnished with nothing save a table, a chair, and a bed. Once the man had Cecile safely inside, they then locked the door and left. This wasn't intended to keep the nobility out. It was to prevent Cecile from running away. Not long after the men's footsteps faded, Cecile smelled the odor of blood in the night air. The men had spread it around so the presence of the sacrifice might be known. As the minutes passed, Cecile's mind slipped further and further into panic. There was no way a girl of eighteen could sit calmly and wait for her own demise. There were only two reasons she didn't smash the chair against the door in an attempt to break it or flip over the table. Because the furniture was too heavy and because she was still thinking about the couple that had raised her. Instead, the girl crouched on the floor and pounded the bed with her fist as she sobbed. Just how much time passed, she couldn't say. Cecile suddenly lifted her head. She was horribly cold. The tracks of her tears were freezing. The depths of her ears froze. There was a harsh rasping sound on the far side of the door, like a key turning. Cecile felt like her heart had shrunk down to nothing. Just when it seemed like she could take no more, another sound dealt the final blow to her heart, closing around it like a fist. The creak of hinges. The door was slowly opening, first part in. Second part. The girl reflexively moved to the wall opposite the door, though she wanted to let out a scream that caught in her throat. She'd never seen a noble. While their appearance and actions in the elders' tales had always been incredible, those had always been mere stories that ended with the telling. Or so she thought. Now a deep fear came back to her from the marrow of her bones, from the depths of a darkness she never could have imagined, climbing the long, long stairway to the underside of her soul. It stood in the doorway, and it came as little consolation that it was a girl about her age, but far more beautiful. Her face had not translucent skin, and at its center glowed a pair of red lights. The ground rustled dryly, and it was the sound of the hem of her blue dress dragging across the floor. From behind the woman, the autumn night breezes billowed into the hut through the doorway. Somewhere out in the forest, men and women from the village would probably be talking of love again. The girl closed her eyes. Nothing happened. Unable to stand it any longer, she opened them again. The woman stood before her. Just as she noticed the white fangs and that mercilessly gaping mouth, the girl also saw leaves blowing through the open door. As Cecile's mind was about to plummet into the abyss, she sensed that the woman had stopped. Hold it right there, you bastard. Or slut, I guess. Lyle shouted, adjusting his grip on his harpoon as he stood in the doorway. What? Do you think you're doing, woman? Back to the cursed pages of history with you. A man. And the woman seemed to say to herself as she pulled away from Cecile's body. 
A woman's blood is sweet but thin, a man's is bitter but thick, and that's what I like. I believe I'll fist on you first. The face that turned in his direction was ferocious in its beauty. A lock of black hair had slipped free of her dazzling jewel-encrusted hair clip and fallen across her face, and the fangs that peeked out over her grinning crimson lips were razor sharp. Was this a noble? Even as terror froze the blood in his veins, Lyle raised his harpoon and said, If it's me you want, come and get me. But not in cramped quarters like this. I'll take you on outside. You would have me leave the girl. I'm afraid that won't happen. As if pushed by the woman's sneer, the door behind Lyle slammed shut. Damn it all, he growled. I like confined spaces. Your screams echo in such places, and the shadows of your death throws dance on the walls. This way I can savor the experience. Drink your blood leisurely. I want the girl to watch your humiliating end. Shut your mouth. And the boy bellowed, his words shattering his own fear. Capable of sticking in rock, the harpoon flew with unerring precision at the left side of the woman's chest, and actually embedded itself in the stone wall behind her. The woman grinned. Not so much as a single drop of blood stained the wound. What's more, the very shredded fibers around the tear in her blue dress seemed to knit themselves back together and repair the garment. Had enough fun in games? she asked. That's all the resistance your kind can offer mine. You had your nerve to think you could ever rule the world in our stead. The woman thought that he was the only one who could possibly manage such a thing. What, what are you? Her voice was like a cry of pain, but it also held a kind of fascinated praise. What are you? Dee said, repeating the very same question. Last night, two people had their throats torn open on the east edge of town. Was that your doing? Suppose I said it was. White light traced across in the air. When the table she'd kicked across the room had been sliced to quarters, the woman retreated to the wall to her rear. As both her palms came in contact with the wall, cracks raced across it like the threads of a spider web. And then her form slipped through the newly made hole into the darkness, with a rough wooden stick hurtling from the left hand right behind her. <coughs> there was no response. Becoming a black wind, Dee slipped through the hole. A gunshot rang out from somewhere in the woods. As Dee ducked, hot light whizzed right over his head and bit into a distant tree trunk. Dee could feel the woman's presence melting into the stillness of the forest. As they twisted around, he let a rough wooden needle fly toward where the shot had originated. A man's scream rang out, and another shot flew off into the heavens. Concealed behind a tree some fifteen feet away, a gentleman, who looked to be a middle-aged farmer, was slumped on the ground, clutching his right wrist. A two-shot rifle lay by his feet. Undoubtedly the shot from the needle's impact had been enough to make him drop the weapon. You damn monster. Don't you lay a hand on my Cecile. That cry made the person's identity clear. Hearing the voice, Lyle dashed out while nursing his hip. That's Cecile's father, he called out, putting a stop to any further trouble. After Cecile had been seen off, her adopted father had spent a long time grumbling to himself, although he finally loaded his rifle and headed off to save his beloved child. Cecile's parents knew better than anyone what thoughts occupied their daughter's mind when she'd quietly accepted her fate. When Steve revived Cecile, and she'd opened her eyes, she and her father threw their arms around each other and wept. So what are we supposed to do now? Lyle asked Dee, dabbing at eyes swollen by contagious tears. She's safe for tonight, 
they'll come tomorrow, and the village goons will splash more blood around, and we can't leave her here, and if she goes back to her house, they'll catch her right away, leave her here, what did he say, her father exclaimed, and the color draining from his face, he had no intention of letting her be offered up as a sacrifice a second time. Cecile defeated the idea of relocating her family, saying, If we were to move somewhere else and they found out about me, they probably wouldn't take us in. Besides, my father and mother are too old to be starting over someplace new. Even if they were to break the edict of the village and run off, their likenesses will be communicated to all the neighboring villages. And in most cases, local rules would bar them from entering any other community. In order to start a new life, a fugitive had to travel far across the frontier. Leave her here and guard her by night. And then destroy the noble by daylight and everything will be fine. Miles clapped his hands together at Dee's assessment, saying, That's a great idea. Let's go with that. Said Dee. What do you mean? You still don't feel like helping us out. There's a reason to fear the nobility could go looking for other victims. If that happens, both you and the girl's father will be in danger since you helped us get rescue her. I suppose you have a point there, Lyle said as he went pale. Well, they're not there, I actually believed offering a sacrifice would limit the damage done by the nobility. If Cecile remaining unharmed caused others to be victimized, the mayor and his cronies wouldn't take it quietly. The responsibility wouldn't fall solely on Cecile, but also on Lyle, and everyone else who dated her. Even if the sheriff tried to intercede, a lynching might be unavoidable. You might be the great vampire under D, but even you can't keep an eye on the entire village. For better or worse, we've got to find that noble woman. While the sun shines and pound a damn stake into her. Pulling his harpoon out of the wall, Lyle donned an anxious expression. I put this right through her heart and it still didn't matter a bit to her. Noble or not, something she's not right about that. There are all kinds of nobles, Dee said, his reply surprising Lyle. Fearing slaughter in human hands, some replace their flesh with machinery. Some can change the molecular structure at will, becoming a mist or a rainbow. Others initially have muscles, literally have muscles of steel, but the woman who was here tonight was unlike any of them. A foe the likes of which you've never even heard of. This is utterly hopeless, Lyle remarked as he folded his arms. You don't suppose that Noble will attack anyone else, do you? Cecile inquired anxiously. It'll take her at least two days to recover from the needle I put through her. She'll be in no position to attack again. Tonight, she'll be safe. In leaving them, Dee stepped outside. Lyle followed after him. Though it's bent in a frown, he said, I'm through asking for anything. Just watch. I'll keep Cecile safe all by myself. Good for you, came a voice from Dee's hip as he sat in the saddle. For a second, Lyle was stunned. That voice really doesn't suit you. Stop talking like somebody's granddad. But I want you to remember something. Me and you might end up going after the same thing. If that happens, I don't want to hear any talk about me being in the way. Or screwing things up. Because I'm going to protect Cecile my way. Dee began to ride away without saying a word. Behind him, Lyle waved one arm and shouted, Thank you. I'll never forget that you saved her. Your face might be an iron mask, but you're a good enough guy. Then the boy sighed. I may not be crazy about my father, but he is the mayor. Guess I should call a meeting with him. Second part in. Third part. Where are you going? The rain seemed to ask. The section gripped by his left hand to be precise. Getting the reply, the voice continued. The pond? With your eyes, underwater at night would still be clear as day. Was there some lead on the nobility inside of what you found yesterday? Dee didn't answer. 
His elegant visage merely stared into the darkness ahead. The wind stroked his hair and fluttered the hem of his coat. That woman. She must be the one responsible for what happened last night. His left hand continued. In which case... I guess she's not your run-of-the-mill nobility. Looks like we got a real pain in the ass on our hands. You figure going into the pond is going to solve this mystery. Granted, there seems like there'd be some connection between this and the nobility's research. Holding its tongue for a while, the voice then said, The wind is cold, and it smells like apples and plums. It sure is fall. This is just... The sort of season that could rouse a romantic noble. You have to wonder what the timing of the coincidence was, hmm? Just before the voice let out that final cry of surprise, Dee had pulled tight on the reins. The road left the forest and ran off across the plains. Up ahead the ground rose, and at the very crest of the hill there suddenly stood a pale figure. At the moment, the moon was right over her head. If the age most befitting the season was seventeen or eighteen, then that's how old the girl in the white dress must have been. If the color most appropriate to the season was a muted green, then that was the color of her hair. And if falling leaves were the most appropriate thing in the season, then that's what danced at her feet. She's a noble, right? The left hand asked, conviction in its voice. Had more than one noble been lured out by the fall night? A second later, D charged forward on his sidewall horse. Though was the sort of fierce gallop that would have prompted even a good-sized man to leap out of the way. The girl stood and waited without so much as twitching. Eyes the same color as her hair reflected D and her expression suggested she was lost in contemplation, spinning a eulogy for D and the fall. Firm up on his mount, D brought his right hand around, just as it had back in the swamp when it sliced through the surrounding him. The flash into the scabbard painted an impossibly long arc, but D's blade gave him no indication of innate contact. D saw white mist moving away, driven by the wind whose naked steel had stirred. Soundlessly drifting dozens of feet, it collected at the base of a grove off to the left and took the form of the girl. As she turned to flutter away, D raised his right hand. The blade of his sword was now grasped between his knees. A yellowish hue whipped across his field of view. Barely missing the girl's back, his mule sank into the tree trunk beside her. We've got all kinds of things popping up, a hoarse voice remarked. It didn't sound like it was teasing him now. Moonlight swallowed the black rider and white mount, as if to further ornament the autumn night. D turned his gaze to his left hand. His fingers now clutched a yellowed leaf. When he put his strength into his fist, fragments of the withered leaf scattered in the wind. Did that leaf get in your way? The mouth that had formed in his palm muttered. It finally makes sense why they'd wake up now. These nobles have to fall for an ally, don't they? That could present a bit of a problem. Naturally, there was no reply. It almost seemed as if the warrior, in black, with his heaven-sent beauty, was a captive of autumn thoughts. Fit for him. That night, there were more strange occurrences than had ever happened in the history of the village. At the time the vampire hunter was facing the girl in white out among the fields, 
dozing old Helga suddenly woke in her little house and tried with almost no success to fathom the dream she'd just had. At about the same time, a couple that had been in a neighboring village on business returned home to find their daughter sitting in a chair in the living room instead of sleeping. On shaking her head by the shoulder. <laughs> on shaking her by the shoulder, they suddenly found that she was dead. Shortly after that, Nan Murtaugh was pulled back to reality. In his bed by an argument between one of his servants and his son, who'd forced his way into the house in the middle of the night. Since you've been disowned, you're not my son any longer. You'll simply have to wait until tomorrow. In the eyes of the law, we're still father and son. And this is urgent. Lyle blustered back. And then he laughed aloud at the sight of his father with bandages wrapped around his nose. This is probably the happiest I've ever been to see you, said the boy. State your business. I want you to give the guards the following orders. Look for the noble's hideout by day. Patrol around each and every house and down by night. And if they see a noble woman in a blue dress, they will get in touch with us. The mayor gazed at his son in disbelief. So you've seen a noble, have you? Then I guess you weren't out to Cecile after all. Tell me it isn't so. You couldn't possibly have gone and interfered with the nobility. Though the mayor's surpassing rage made him cringe, Lyle didn't back away. It wasn't interfering. At any rate, Cecile safely made it through her first night. Did you understand everything I just told you? You robbed me of my mother. The least you could do is try, make up for it. She died because of those damn bandits. Instead of acting like a good son, you've been nothing but trouble up till now. So don't try playing the victim. When those bandits attacked your wagon, Mom would have survived if you hadn't cut the horse free and taken off with them on your own. Don't let anyone else die now. Huh. So, Cecile is fine. And this proposal of yours, I take it you didn't come up with that on your own. That hunter is in on this, isn't he? Well, he hasn't heard the end of this yet. Before you make any crazy plans for revenge, you should take care of the nobility first. I'll protect Cecile. All the rest of you have to do is find the noble. And then the pretty boy will do the rest. You've seen what he can do, I'm sure. And the mayor fell silent. Lyle's words had gone right through the bullseye. When the mayor lost the tip of his nose, his heart was filled with fear and anger. And I hope that was almost a prayer. Yeah, maybe this young man will be the one. Okay, that's all you have to do. There's no need for your people to battle the nobility. All we need is enough manpower to find the thief, Lyle said, pressing the issue now that he saw the promise in his father's reaction. Hmm? Oh, we've got the manpower to kill the, that is. Basra said as he pushed his way through the door. In his arms, he held a girl with death sealed on her parrot and pale face. What's all this? To the mayor, who had just risen from his chair, he said, It looks like your kid has really gone and screwed things up for us. This is Shakira's daughter. Her parents got back from the neighboring village a little while ago and found her like this. It can't be. 
two stone gazes forward down on the steep fud lyre like boiling water. It appears that the hunter will be searching for us, and you won't be getting off scot free either, Lyle. Where is he? The mayor asks, once again in the well practiced role of the obstinate old man, tracing even a shadow of a doubt. Chapter 2 